Hey guys, we're here for episode 22 of the e-commerce opportunity when I'm joined by John. Hi John, how are you? Good, how about yourself? Doing well, thanks man. Hey, so we were just chatting before this and I basically said to you, all the stuff that we were talking about before this, we should probably just record. So uh, for those listening or those watching, this is going to be a little bit different of a format. This is going to be a little bit more conversational and kind of just some back and forth. Um, before we do that, though, I do want to get your background just so people have context on you know, who you are and kind of maybe some of the things we'll talk about. Sure. So I'm the founder and CEO of The Good. Uh, the Good is a conversion rate optimization firm. So we help brands to convert more of their existing website traffic from visitors into customers. Uh, we do that through data science. Uh, I've been doing this for, we just had our 12th anniversary in April. And uh, so we were one of the early players in this field uh, before it was even called conversion optimization. I mean, we called it continual optimization back then. Um, and yeah, we work with brands like Nike, Xerox, Adobe, The Economist, um, and dozens and dozens of, of smaller but e-commerce brands that you probably already know. So um, yeah, it's uh, it's been a wild ride and a lot of fun. And uh, the past 18 months of e-commerce has is, is treated us kindly. So um, I'm very appreciative of that. That's awesome. Well, I well, appreciate that. I mean, I have a ton of questions, obviously, about you and the business. But one thing I want to talk about, which is we kind of touched on it briefly, your setup is, is really nice. How important do you think right now, like with being remote, like having a good mic and a good camera is, do you think it matters? Does it not matter? I think that the message matters more than the medium, quite honestly, but uh, we wanted to step it up because we do so much content. Um, James Sowers, our director of marketing, produces so much content and uh, we try to keep the quality as high as we possibly can. And what we quickly realized during, um, you know, when everything got shut down during the pandemic was we're going to do a lot more virtual events. I started being on, uh, you know, I was doing a lot of podcasts pre pandemic, but now it was like, you know, a handful per week and it just started adding up and we're like, okay, we should probably do something nicer. Um, so we used to just have a TV behind me and I was using the webcam off the monitor and, uh, a nice mic and it all sounded good. And, and, you know, would work great on audio, but as more and more videos start coming out, it just didn't look as presentable. Um, and then, uh, Shopify asked me to film a course on optimization for their compass e-learning platform that they have. And, um, we decided to, to take that opportunity to really step up the video production. And so I think it keeps in line with always wanting to, you know, do the best quality content that we can. And video is a huge portion of that now. So here we are. Yeah, dude, I completely agree for, for me, I was creating content probably the past year and, you know, I had a bunch of like white background stuff and, you know, my audio sucked, but people stuck with me to your point because the content was really, really good. And now just making my video and my audio better, it just makes it that much easier for, for people to follow along. So very much in the same mindset in terms of like the, the Shopify thing, right? Like for mm -hmm. someone like myself, someone listening, right? Like that kind of seems like the Holy grail. How does an opportunity of like that come up? Did you seek them out? Did they seek you out? Um, what did that look like? Well, they found me, but it's more about being consistent. And so, you know, I mentioned we've been in business 12 years for 10 of that we have released a new insight article every week. So we try to write at least 2000 or 2,500 words a week. Lately, what we've been doing over the past, probably 10 to 12 months has been, um, much more around producing longer content that is way more in depth and actionable and getting into, you know, 5,000 to 10,000 words per week. Um, and then what we also do is use that content and follow, you know, you're probably familiar with Ross Simmons and the dream model that he's got. So following that model, right, where we're taking every bit of content and breaking it down into 12 additional pieces of content. Um, that's, you know, not anything that's, you know, rel relatively new. I mean, it's, it's something that's been around. I think, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk, the Gary V content model is very, very similar, right? It all starts with documenting, not creating, but then taking that content. And it's the exact same thing as a dream model, breaking that same content up in 10 different ways, using it on all these different platforms. And, um, and then it's the distribution that matters at times more than the, than the content or how it started. 
Um, and if your quality is high, then you can do that. So for me, it was all about, you know, making sure we're producing high quality content. And that's how we've always gotten our leads has been through content. We've never really done outbound. I think once we did, we bought a list and did email outbound. And honestly, that's how we landed at Xerox. So maybe we should do it again <laughs> because I was shocked that Xerox was like, yeah, hey, let's meet. And I was like, what? I sent you an email out of the blue. That didn't end up in your spam folder at Xerox, but whatever. Um, so I'm, every time I tell that story, I'm like, you know, maybe we should do that again. But the reality is we sent out, you know, thousands and thousands of emails. And that was the only client we got out of it. Um, and I just think that what if you can provide value, people will, will start to follow you. I mean, I've been really impressed with this podcast, Chase. I've been following it and the amount of content you're putting out on this podcast. It seems like there's a new episode coming out every day. And so and they're all great quality. Right. So eventually, you know, if it's not already happening, like people are going to latch onto that and they're going to say, oh, wow, he's producing he really knows what he's talking about. He's producing high quality content. There's something there. Um, and it's really hard to hide uh, incompetence when you're producing a lot of content. It's really easy to go out and publish a thousand words every month because you can find something to talk about. And a thousand words, you don't have to go very deep. But when you start going really, really deep, people people understand that you're you know what you're talking about. And this is this is so good and so helpful. I, I really like this. I kind of want to break down so this content piece that you're creating. Um, is there a specific person or there multiple person on the team that are doing this solely? Is this just a portion of someone's job? It sounds like this content mainly lives, you know, initially on the website and then is parsed down into Twitter threads. I don't know, maybe videos on TikTok. Like, can we, we kind of break that down and, and, and of that, like, which of the platforms do you think are most, um, opportune, like for this content that you're creating? Like, are you guys hitting it off on Twitter versus LinkedIn versus et cetera? So great questions. I would say that the the first thing we always do is start almost always. It, it starts of one or two ways. It starts as a written article. And that's where generally what we'll do is, is it starts with the thread from a uh, internal team member who is a subject matter expert. We'll interview them, put an outline to, or ask them to put an outline together. But often for a lot of the articles that um, you know I've written, I, I sit down and I interview one of our team members or have have the marketing team interview me and then we get a nice outline together that we can write from and it just flows so much quicker um in fact i have a, a book that is sitting with a publisher right now and in, in that going through that process and that's exactly how i wrote the book i brought a couple of our key team members together once a week we would sit down for an hour and discuss the topic that i knew i wanted to write about and we would record it transcribe it and then I would take that and, and pull out the key points and examples we talked about. And I had a book within a few months um, and it was great. And um, from there, it was just fleshing it out, editing it, et cetera. So um, that's going to be, you know, a lot of fun to see that come to fruition based on that method. But the second way that this typically the content comes to life is podcasts. So we have our insight, uh, the e-commerce insight show that James uh, runs and does interviews on and that has been great because we're able to take those interviews and turn them into great actionable articles where we're basically digesting what the the podcast was um and then i do a podcast called drive and convert where uh, i do that with a um, partner of ours who focuses on driving traffic one of the largest uh, seo SEM firms and you know it's great because I interview him one show, he interviews me the next, and we just go back and forth and I'm learning everything I can from him just because I'm curious. I'm not, we're not planning on going into driving traffic, but I know so little about driving traffic. He's schooling me every other week and every other week I'm schooling him on how to convert that traffic that they're sending. And we do share a lot of joint clients, but it's just a lot of fun. And we just, you know, we've gotten to know each other pretty well. So I'm able every other week, I'm able to give a 45 minute recording to our marketing team to turn into an article. And, you know, it's straight from, from my mouth to the page with their editing. And, um, so between podcasts and written articles, we've got tons of content to work with. Uh, and then we distribute it all over the place. I mean, it always starts on our blog or our podcast feed. Um, but you know, we do turn that into, 
Twitter threads, Twitter posts to promote that, but also LinkedIn. Um, and I'm, you know, James is really pushing me to get more active on Twitter. Um, so I'm working on that, but I'm much more active on LinkedIn. I, I have been consistently there for, for years. Yeah, that's awesome. There, there's, wow, there's a lot of ways I want to take this. I think for one, like from my own personal experience, like Twitter has been like surprisingly the channel I, I've enjoyed the most. It's a channel that I think I have now the, the largest reach and the most opportunities have come from. I think the, the D to C and e-commerce, you know, Twitter hemisphere is really interesting. Um, led to a lot of clients, a lot of great connections. So would definitely, you know, recommend that. For, for, for me, I think what's worked on Twitter is two things. One is the quality and the consistency of the content, very much like you're speaking to. Like I'd spend a lot of time, probably more time than I want to admit yeah. actually creating the content and editing the content. Right. And then two is being connected with the right people, right? Getting the right people to like and comment and retweet is really the, the, the secret sauce and the name of the game. Mm -hmm. And I've been shocked with like how much organic reach there is on Twitter, right? Facebook organic reach is very limited and dead to who follows you. Instagram is yeah, kind of whatever. It's kind of a hit or a miss. Um, whereas like Twitter and LinkedIn, like there are a lot of chances to be able to go viral and you really don't even need that many followers. You just need the right followers. Yeah. Great point. And I think that's where, you know, there's been a lot of Slack communities that, you know, uh, we, we met on a, on a Slack community that's really active with the DTC community and, you know, those type of things are, are really blowing up now. Um, and it's all about the quality of the members and the quality of the people contributing. So I, I see Twitter being no different where the more quality content I post, the more quality followers I get. Um, and that initially was why I didn't put a lot of time into Twitter was because, um, a, I didn't put the time to putting content together tailored for Twitter. So doing a threads, doing the short hit things that aren't just, Hey, here's the latest article and, you know, link to it. Right. Really got to put some effort to it. As you said, you know, it takes a lot more time than, than either of <laughs> us would like to admit probably. Right. Um, but at the same time, you know, the quality of the followers matters a lot because early on I was getting a lot of just, you know, I, I don't want to, downplay it it was it was a lot of like followers that you wouldn't want to follow back i'll leave it at that and so the reality is that um it wasn't really encouraging to because nobody would respond and leave comment you know reply with the comments or anything that would lead to a conversation yep. it was always just me sending information out so now that you know i'm starting to get some good comments back people you know and then it, it, i make it a point to always you know continue that thread um, and just be helpful. I think, you know, jumping in where I can yes. and being helpful is, is huge. And that's no different than a Slack community or anything else at that, that point. Right. Yeah. One last thing I'll say about Twitter. And then I have a couple questions I want to get to, um, in terms of Twitter, I think one other thing that I've tried, that's really interesting. I've never seen anyone do. And the reason I ask this is people always DM me, like, how's it going? Mm -hmm. I actually run promoted Twitter ads, right? But the ads aren't necessarily an ad. They're like popular posts that I'm just boosting mm -hmm. to my followers and people like my followers um, and it feels very organic. Like you almost scroll through in the feed and you, you, you don't even notice that it's promoted. Right. So I think that's really been a key for me is like promoting my tweets. And I don't spend a lot of money. I spend hundred, 200, $300 a month. Sometimes if I forget, maybe I spend 400 or 500, but like <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to spend like a hundred or 300 dollars a month, just trying to like make yeah. sure that I sit top of mind. So that's also one other thing I found pretty helpful on, on Twitter. And the return on that's got to be huge, right? I mean, it's it's just a matter uh, for a couple hundred a month, you know, uh, you wouldn't get very far in Google AdWords, right? Or even Instagram, probably not very far. But on Twitter, it's so reasonable, right? Um, that's the challenge I've always had with LinkedIn, too, is advertising on LinkedIn is just so expensive yeah. um, that it's almost not worth it, almost. And the, But the organic stuff, you can really... You know, I have such, now I have such a great following on, on LinkedIn that, and a community on there that, you know, I post, I'm going to have six or eight comments that yeah. I can start replying to. And then it just kind of snowballs from there based on their algorithm, um, which is great. But, you know, I, I think if I put it that much effort into Twitter, probably would see more return than, than I do on LinkedIn. But um, I chose LinkedIn and chose poorly, I guess, but they're both great. <laughs> I think LinkedIn's a great platform. I think adding Twitter to the arsenal makes a lot of sense. So mm -hmm. one, one interesting thing I've been talking to one of my uh, business partners about um, his name's Nick Shackelford. He, he does a lot of paid social. 
Um, one interesting comment that he he made to me is like, he and I were, were business partners at an agency called Structure. We almost never talk about our agency, like almost to a fault. Like we, we never talk about it. We never say we want to work with clients. We need clients. And when people think about myself, they think about e-commerce email marketing. They don't think about my agency. And when they think about him, they think about paid social. They don't think about, you know, our agency, right? When, when you're kind of doing content and creating content, do people, or when people are coming in, they know you as John, like the CRO guy, and you happen to have an agency, or do they know you as, you know, you own an agency called The Good, and, and that's why they're coming in? Like, does that make sense? Like, what are your thoughts on, like, founders with personal brands and leading with that versus, like, founders repping, like, the agency, and that's all mm-hmm. they do and all they talk about? Well, I think that there's a, a couple of ways uh, to answer this. And, and the first is that I think a personal brand is necessary. If it's something that, uh, if you truly are, and I hate the term, but if you're truly a thought leader, and as I said earlier, if you really do know what you're talking about, people will, will start to follow you and understand. And, um, and if you ride that, that middle ground, like I always say, there's a fence in the middle of two yards, right? And if you're sitting on the fence, nobody's going to care what you say. But if you take a stance in one way or the other and you say, hey, we've done some research and this is what we believe, then you'll get some raving fans. You'll also have some haters, right? Some raving haters, but that's okay. You need those people to help fuel and push you. Um, The number of times I've gotten comments on LinkedIn where somebody's like, you know, oh, we've run this same test and that's not the results we got. It's like, great. Well, let's talk about your results and my results and and let's let's figure out how we both get better because of this right and so a lot of people in those instances who just want to call you out um are either just upset that there's a lot of comments and and or want the spotlight on them so i usually just turn it right back to them and say okay let's discuss that um but i think that that's important as well to to not just be in the boring middle right you just can't do that but you know i i think that um it's important to have a personal brand and the, the downfall to having a personal brand is people often want to work with you directly. And so I spend a lot of time on sales calls, but I always say, you know, like, Hey, I hire people who do this every day and they're better than me. And you're trusting me to make sure I have the right team put together here and that they're going to truly have a good understanding of your situation and spend a lot more time with you than I'm going to be able to do. And when that happens, you know, we're in a good spot. Um, and brand and consumers usually in the brands we work with usually understand that. Yeah, dude, that actually really resonates with me on every single sales call. I make sure that I make the point that, Hey, sure. You came in and you discovered our company, you discovered me, but you're coming and actually going to be working and staying from the team. Right. I Mm -hmm. think, you know, I, I, I've been having, I've probably done hundreds of sales calls over the past few years and maybe in like one or two calls, I forgot to say that, right? Cause I just felt like I had said it so many times and I thought I already had said it. And then the one or two times I didn't say it, there was misalignment. They came in thinking I was getting on the account and I never talked to them. Right. So they're like, mm-hmm. what the heck? And, but for everyone else that had the expectation up front and before they signed the agreement knew that that was like the biggest difference. So I'm, I'm with you there. I think the personal brand is really great for building the trust and bringing people in. But to your point, like I think every single person on my team, whether it's a designer, a copywriter, mm-hmm. developer, they are all way better. It's like, sure, if you want me on that account, it's not going to be as good as if you actually have my team on it. Yeah. And I think most clients that are sophisticated understand that, right? It's like when people find Gary Vanderchuk, let's just go to the extreme example here, right? Uh, not comparing myself to that by any means. But when, when you know, he's out there, doing events and, and speaking and, and a brand sees him, they don't go, Oh, Gary's going to work on my account. Right. They're like, Hey, you know what? Gary has a great team. And the fact is, is Gary's out here, you know, prom- by way of pr- promoting himself, he's promoting his company. And the reality is they don't have the expectation they're going to work with him. And I think that that's key. And you know, that also does help weed out um, clients who aren't going to be a good fit perhaps, right? If they come in and they say, no, I have to work with you. Well, we're probably not going to be a good fit then because the chance of me working with you is, is near zero because A, I don't have the time and B, I don't do client work like that anymore. Um, and that's, you know, the key is to not be egotistical when you say that, 
and that's a hard thin line to to ride for sure yeah no i completely agree i want to talk now about like the client side right so one of the brands that you mentioned that you landed was, was xerox like how important is like that logo to other big brands and how important is the logo like that to a small data c brand like do the small data c brands care do they not care like can we talk about like the perception of like who your clientele is and, and how that allows you to get new clients or, or, or maybe it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Social proof is real and it works. Um, this is why, you know, I'm in Portland, Oregon. That's where the good was started. Nike is based in Portland, Oregon. Every agency in Portland has done something with Nike and has their logo on there because they damn near do it for free and they do it for free to get the logo. Right. Um, and, and then you'll see really successful firms as they get, you know, to that mid tier, maybe not up to like the massive, you know, agencies, but in that mid tier, they're not working with Nike anymore. They still have the logo, but they're not doing it because unless you can get that like agency of record and own a whole division of Nike or a whole, you know, thing like a Wyden Kennedy here does or something like that. The reality is it's not worth it because Nike wants to pay you next to nothing to work with them because they know that there's going to be a hungry small firm of two or three people who are just starting out that will do a great job and they're going to overinvest in it. And so the reality is, I think, you know, it's important um, and you got to, you know, um, it's funny. Somebody told me once when I started doing a lot more speaking and they said, hey, you know, you got to treat this like a comedian. And what I mean by that is you're going to have to play the small, dingy, smoky bars that, you know, everybody's drunk and no one's paying attention to you. And after you do that a few times, you can level up to playing things and playing things. And eventually you'll get to arenas, but you got to earn that. You don't just jump in and go right to the arenas. And I think it's the exact same way with clients. Um, you got to earn, earn that. Right. And so the logos are almost like, here's our resume. Here's who we've worked with before and why you can trust us because Nike, Xerox, et cetera, has, has trusted us. Um, and I think that enterprise brands want to play with other enterprise plans, right? And so it, it's one of those things where um, it's the, where I see it hurts more is on those smaller mid-sized brands where, yeah, we could probably come in and, and work with them. Um, and we're right on the cusp of like, could they afford us and do they find the value in it? And can we drive a good return on, on investment from our side? They look at that and they go, wow, you know, if they're working with those brands, we probably can't afford them. So they don't even reach out or they reach out and they're just like, Hey, you know, can you actually do something for a few hundred a month? It's like, absolutely not. Sorry. We're in the wrong spot. Right? So I think that's where it hurts more, um, is the startups. Um, but eventually, you know, going back to the analogy of, of the comedian, you, you start leveling up to the point where you don't, you're not working with them anyways, right? Your, your value-based pricing perhaps. Yeah, man, that's, that's great. I really appreciate that insight. I think I have a couple more questions that have kind of come to mind in terms of brands, whether they want to work with you or they want to work with someone else, or they want to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. Like how does someone actually know whether or not they need CRO? Does, does every brand need CRO? Is it a certain revenue size and traffic size when they need to are like, how, if I'm a brand, like, do I know that I actually need this? Well, I think that, how do you want to talk about CRO? Because I would think that every brand needs CRO, but it depends on what you're talking about with CRO, right? So if you're saying um, that it's AB testing or that really scientific angle of it, then yeah, you have to be a certain size in order to get a return on investment from that. Right. And you have to be doing a few million a year. Potentially you have to have enough conversions where you're going to get a large return. If you make some small changes that are impactful changes, but you know, you're not shooting for the moon here. Right. Um, you're, you're going about it, um, you know, in a methodical scientific way. Right. Um, and it can be really, really impactful at that, at that level. But if you're a small brand, you still need to be doing a lot of the core tenants of conversion optimization you still have to be talking to your consumers. You still have to be looking at the data and tracking, you know, the, the data you can, you can, you know, you could be a few hundred visits a day and still get Google analytics. That's meaningful to some degree. You could still do heat maps and click maps and scroll maps and that type of data. You could still do user testing, right? You, you could do user testing and have zero visitors. 
So all of these things are, are really um, things you could be thinking about. Um, so I think that, you know, I'm a firm believer, of course, I'm a little biased, but I'm a firm believer that a company of every size should be doing CRO. Um, and it doesn't, the tactics will change based on how big you are. And that's part of why I wrote this, this new book. Um, it's called opting into optimization. And, uh, it is going, it, it is all about the specific theory behind optimization, how you should be thinking about it, not the specific tactics you should deploy. The last book, I, book I wrote, um, you know, stop marketing, start selling was all about the tactics, how too many brands, when they get a consumer to the site, they continue to market to that consumer on their site instead of trying to convert that consumer. And they kind of get in their own way because of that. So we gave them a whole bunch of tactics on how to do that. So I want to take a step back with this new book and really focus on the strategies and the philosophy that you should be thinking about behind this. And this is great. And when I ask, a que- when I ask that question, like, I think part of that question is me not really understanding like what CRO actually is. And I think that's like the thing that I face with a lot of companies. It's like, well, do I do CRO? Like, what does it actually look like? When do I start? Am I too big? Am I too small? So it almost seems like, and again, I'm sure this is the case of every industry, right? I like to think everyone knows that email is important, but for a long time, a lot of people slept on email and they still continue to, right? So I, I think part of the problem in your industry is like, there just needs to be more education. And it sounds like mm-hmm. a lot of your guys' goal in your content marketing is educating people on the who, the why, the how, the what, so that way they can say, oh, I actually do have these problems. I started. I need to start figuring this out. My conversion rate of 1% it actually could be 3% of my industry or 5%, right? Um, so I, I appreciate that context because me not understanding it, I don't actually even know what things I should be asking you, right? Well, but think about it this way, Chase. You're not alone in that. Um, part of my job is the, the founder and CEO of The Good is to educate. It is to help make sure that we bring in the right leads. Um, and of course, marketing plays a, a role in that. But the reality here is that I'm the one who needs to be that gatekeeper to some degree, right? And it's a really hard job when um, the term conversion rate optimization has become really commoditized over the last handful of years. And brands are all pushing. There's tool sets. There's plugins for Shopify. I mean, look, if you type in conversion on the Shopify app store, you're going to get hundreds, maybe thousands of apps that come up. And every one of them says we improve your conversion rate. But the reality is true conversion rate optimization is not about a specific tactic. It's not about changing button colors or, you know, doing any of those types of things. No, it's about better understanding your consumer and making sure that you are helping them accomplish the two tasks that they're at your site to do. They heard about you from a friend, an ad, social post, whatever it may be. And they came to your site because they think that your brand can help them solve a pain or a need. Right. And so the first thing they want to do is determine, can you help solve their pain or their need? And if you can, they want to convert as quickly and easily as possible and get on with their lives. And so you need to help brands. uh, Brands need to help their consumers accomplish those two things. And anything else that you do just gets in the way. And so really, it's all about how, you know, can you do a, a Can you pass a five second test where you show a consumer your homepage for five seconds and they can explain what problem you're solving and what products you have? Um, You know, it's little things like that that I think a lot of um, folks focus on the tactics and a lot of those apps and, and quick hit hacks and things like that. You see tons of Shopify apps that talk about conversion and they're here tomorrow or here today and gone tomorrow because people try them. And they're like, oh, that sounds really, really good for a hundred bucks a month. I can do all these things. And the next thing they know is it really didn't move the needle. Um, and, and it just complicated the site. So. Yeah, totally get that. That's helpful. One thing I'm thinking about that I, I would love to get your uh, feedback or insight on is like for someone that's listening or watching like this that might want to get into CRO, um, mm-hmm. how much of CRO, and I, I know you mentioned, right, it's talking to the customer and providing the experience around that. But how much of CRO is like, highly technical and and data driven versus more like creative and design and, and like, who is a good person? Like whether that someone that you want to hire or someone that could be in CRO that might have the skill set that doesn't really know it. Yeah. 
This is a great question, and it's one that we ask ourselves daily at The Good because we're always looking for, for team members. The reality is there's no school, there's no training for CRO. It is such a mix of skill sets. And this is why I mentioned, you know, CRO is becoming a commodity. The problem is there's so many generalist digital marketing agencies who say they do CRO as a bullet point on their site. And the challenge with that is they may have one person on their team that they say does CRO. And this is their CRO strategist or whatever, right? And then their salespeople go out and sell CRO as this add-on service to all these other things. And they, they might move the needle a little bit, but the reality is one person cannot know everything there is to know about CRO because the skill sets are so disparate. So on one hand, you have the technical, as you mentioned, right? And you need to know some programming. Yes, all the tools out there, uh, most of them allow you to do what you see is what you get editing, like Google Optimize, Optimize, Leave EWO, right? I could go on and on with the tool sets, but the reality, Chase, is that they let you move things around and change colors and add text and stuff like that. But if you truly want to do anything that is more than just a few simple visual tweaks, you have to know how to do front end coding. So we build cohorts here for every client. And one of the roles is a developer. It's a front end developer. Um, and then, you know, outside of that, we have um, folks who have degrees in psychology. We have folks who, um, you know, came from product design and usability. Um, you know, we have folks who um, do not uh, came from a background of user testing and really have a good understanding of that. So there's all these these disparate skill sets, and what we look to do is find somebody who can add a new skill set, has some understanding of the rest, but we can help level them up in those other areas, and that's how we've been able to build out a really well well rounded team. And why I always say it's not a one person gig. It just isn't. Um, you can't, you know, it's hard to be a jack of all trades, but can you move the needle? Yeah, you could definitely move the needle by, by, um, you know, focusing on CRO, but you have to choose what area you're going to be an expert in. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I think when I equate this to, you know, email, cause that's the language I understand, right. Um, when mm -hmm. clients ask us or prospects ask us, like, should I go with your agency or an agency in general? Or should I build this in house? It's like, well, you know, it depends. Like, are you going to be willing to build a team? Or are you looking for one person, right? If you're going to hire one person in house to try to do the job that you know our team provides. We, every single client gets five people. Yeah. You got a strategist, a copywriter, a designer, account manager, and a developer, right? To mm -hmm. find all five of those people in house is going to be really expensive. And then you, at the end of the day, are going to have to manage them. So it's kind of like for for us as agency or service providers, uh, it kind of is a benefit because for people to do this in house, it's 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 not impossible, but it's it's challenging and it's expensive mm -hmm. and at the price point of us and potentially even you guys, like it is a lot more cost effective and efficient, especially as brands are scaling to leverage an outsourced team. So I think that is the pro of kind of what, what we do. Um, one question I have, so going back to the Shopify thing, is this mm -hmm. course that you created, is this something that you feel like will solve a need for people that want to understand how to sell CRO as a service, people that want to do CRO mm -hmm. internal? Um, is the course going to be free? Do you know when it goes live? Like, is this kind of, your thesis around why you built it or, you know, Shopify, I said, yes. And of course you're not going to say no. Yeah. Uh, I was definitely more the, the, the latter. I think the reality is, is, um, they came to us with the topic they wanted. Uh, they already have beginner courses and CRO on there and they were looking for experts to nice. really dive a little bit deeper. Um, so it's in editing right now. So I imagine, I'm not sure when this show is going live, but I imagine sometime in July it will be live. Um, the reality is it's on, um, it's going to be on how to audit your own website. So how to look at your website critically through the eyes of your consumer. And that's where we're going a little bit deeper. Um, so I actually, this all came about because I, they invited me to do a webinar with them and it was a learning webinar where, um, you know, the number one thread on the Shopify compass um, board is, um, review my site. Everybody wants site feedback. Wow. So you post your site up there and you get feedback. So I talked to Shopify and they said, Hey, we want to do a webinar together. What, what do we want to do? I said, let's do a live teardown. Everybody on this compass is asking for feedback. Why don't we just hop on for an hour and, and people bring their sites and we'll just screen share their site and talk about it. 
and I'll tear down their site. Essentially, I'll show them what, you know, based on our experience from a decade, what we would change. And it was so popular. And the list was like 200 sites long of people who wanted <laughs> feedback. And there's no way we can get through that. Right. And so afterwards they said, Hey, you know, how about a course on how to do this? that they can start thinking about how to evaluate their own site. And that's how this really came about. So um, this was um, you know, something that took to write it and then film it probably took a couple of months uh, total. And then uh, we have it with a video editor right now. And then it's gonna go live, I would say by July, it should be live for sure. Amazing. Well, John, this is, this is so great. This has been so awesome for, for everyone that's been listening to this episode please share your feedback on how you like this format. Uh, we kind of did an audible as we were talking before this of like, I don't know that I want to keep doing just like the interview. So I want it to be more conversational and flowing. And I never really give any opinion or any interjection or any topics. I kind of just ask questions and, um, you know, don't really share too much. So if you like kind of the back and forth, uh, please let me know. John, thank you so much for, for being here. What is the best way for people to follow along on your journey, come work for you, come work with you? Uh, what social handles, what email, whatever you want to give. Sure. Yeah. Um, email is going to be the best. Just hit me up. It's J O N at the good.com T H E G O O D.com. Uh, there's no H in John. Um, hit me up. I read every email. You ask a question. I'm happy to get back to you. Um, and the good.com is the best place to learn more about the uh, conversion optimization journey. And, I'm easy to find on LinkedIn and uh, my Twitter handle is just John MacDonald, J-O-N-M-A-C-D-O-N-A-L-D. So hit me up in either of those places. And uh, if maybe if you hit me up on Twitter, it will get me on there a little more. Sweet, man. Well, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for the time. And, and this was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.